Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hi, everybody. Trace Blackmore here. I am super excited because I am in Orlando, Florida, and we are experiencing together the 2018 AWT Annual Convention and Expo. So far, it has just started. We still have two days to go. It has been a blast so far. I've met so many of you at the Scaling Up Meetup. That was so cool. I got to meet you. You got to meet me. You told me about the show. You gave me some ideas about the show. And most of all, you told me that this show meant something to you. I love that. That means so much to me. And then you all got to meet each other. I even heard where individuals were teaming up and figuring out how they could go see two different presentations at the same time. Of course, you can't do that unless you have a friend and you in the Scaling Up Nation made friends amongst yourself and now you're comparing notes and you're getting more out of this convention. I love that course, we've heard from former guests. They were speakers here at the convention. There was Mike Standish, Rob Ferguson, great papers. Hopefully you saw those. I've got some things that I'm doing today that I can't wait to do, and I hope to see you there as I'm doing them. I'm going to be moderating a discussion from Russell Baskin of Tower Water. He's going to be talking about his experience with Legionella and what happened to his company when New York decided to make part of ASHRAE 188 law. It changed his business as he knew it, and he is here to share his experiences with all of us. It's going to be an awesome presentation. There's going to be a lot of Q&A, so I can't wait for that one. I am also moderating the Young Professionals Roundtable discussion. It's called the What's, How's, and Why's of the Water Treatment Industry. And folks, it doesn't matter what age you are. These people are going to be talking from their perspective and their generation about our business. So you can't afford not to come and listen to this. No matter what age you are, you are going to get something out of this. And of course, many of you have already found me and asked for a scaling up buttons. I love walking around the exhibit hall and seeing everybody proudly exhibiting their scaling up buttons on their AWT lanyard, that just warms my heart, folks. I know I'm looking at a member of the Scaling Up Nation when I see that. So thank you so much for proudly displaying those. I hope you take those home and display those to remind you to listen to Scaling Up, or maybe even grab an extra one from me and give them to somebody you know will enjoy this show. The Scaling Up Nation has been growing and growing and growing, and that's because of the fine folks out there like you that are telling our fellow water treaters about this podcast. Well, one of those individuals is friend of show James McDonald. And folks, it is hard to think of anybody else that has done so much for the water treatment industry than James McDonald. And the Scaling Up Nation has made it clear that they love all the things that James McDonald does. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to bring James back on to see what he's been up to? So, ladies and gentlemen of the Scaling Up Nation... Here is James McDonald. My lab partner today is returning scaling up guest, James McDonald, CWT. How are you, James? I'm doing fine, Trace. How are you today? I am doing extremely well, and I want to thank you for coming back on Scaling Up. You're very welcome. Anytime. Well, I will let you know that the Scaling Up Nation loves James McDonald, CWT, and they wanted to have you back on. So we're going to be talking about a lot of great things that you're doing and a lot of great things that maybe some people in the Scaling Up Nation don't know that they have available to us. Are you ready for that? I am ready, Trace. Well, before we get to that, what have you been up to since we last spoke to you? Let's see. I believe my last episode aired after the convention, so we we had that, and my responsibilities with the AWT changed. I was the pre-treatment chairman for like 12 years, and now I'm the certification chairman, so I'm getting my feet wet there. 
What are some of the things that you're doing with uh, certification share? Well, we're working to make sure that we have enough quizzes. So when folks want to go and recertify, we have that. There's some training they are working on as well. And we're always looking to make sure that your available options you have to recertify are, you know, as wide ranging as they should be. Awesome. I know that's a lot of work and I know that's volunteer work. So I personally want to thank you for doing that. I also wanted to ask you specifically about your CWT. As you know, I ended last year with the CWT challenge. I am very pleased to report to the chairman of the certification committee that we have had well over 100 people report back that they want to get their certified water technologist designation. And I wanted to ask you, what are some of the reasons that you got your CWT and now many years later, what are some of the benefits that you continue to see because you have it? First off, I want to thank you for being such a champion for it. You, you've done your whole series on, on what it takes to, to get one and recommendations on how to study, and that's fantastic. So thank you for being a champion, Trace. Absolutely. It, it's a pleasure to do so. And like I said, I was amazed when Andy Morcom told me that his number was 300 and something. And my number's 186. So the fact that we've got 10 years in between us and we only have that few CWTs, that was amazing to me. So that, I, that was just one way I thought I'd get the word out and see if we could get that number of certified people up. Out of curiosity, what's your number? I'm number 200. All right. And when did you get yours? I think I took the exam in 2003 and I, and I actually you know, applied and got it in 2004. Okay. That's when I took mine was 2003 as well. So let's go back to before 2003. You obviously decided you wanted to get that designation. Why did you have that thought and what was going on? Well, for me, it was a mark of, of accomplishment. It, it showed that I had learned as much as I had hoped I had learned. Also, I worked in our technical department and all the members of our department at the time, we figured that it was it was a good step for each of us to take so that our entire technical department were certified. We were all, all CWT, so we all took it the same time and we all passed at the same time. And and we took the, the in-person test like, like you did. It was not on a computer. So, you know, we were there with the papers and Scantrons and what have you. James, what are some study tips that you remember that you did for the CWT exam? Well, I, I remember the, the TRTM, the, the Technical Reference and Training Manual, was a, a fantastic resource for using on that. The, the exam itself is structured in the basic format as a TRTM with the same, you know, chapters of the exam. And there was that. The AWT training helps as well, but I didn't attend any of that until after the exam personally. But I, I know you're a big volunteer in that. And what I've seen of it, you know, it's, it's a great resource for the exam. And just basically making sure I had the basics down, because once you have the basics, sometimes you can use an educated guess to figure out what's next, to figure out what maybe you don't know on there. And with the exam itself, I've been on both ends of it, as I believe you were um, at different points as well, where I not only got to take the exam, I got to help write the exam as well. And that, that was a real education there. I didn't know it was so hard to write good exam questions. I didn't know, you know there were people who have their PhDs in making tests. And that was interesting to me, that questions can be enemies of each other, that the options of one question could possibly answer another question. So you have to be careful for that. And you don't want double negatives there or what have you. So, you know, I, it was a learning experience for me all the way around from taking the, the test to actually having the privilege of being able to write the, the next test. Well, where you had the privilege of writing some of the questions, I was one of the people that got to take the questions that you wrote. I think it was 1,200 or something of those at the time. I think now we have well over 5,000 in the bank. So that was quite the ordeal. So for those of you out there that are dreading the 200 questions that you're going to have to take, imagine doing it when it's 1,000 or 1,200. Oh, my goodness. It, it would take quite a while. And I would say probably the hardest portion of the test for, for many people is, is the part on regulatory items. So I think, you know, if, if I were to focus on studying and if I already knew, knew my basics, you know, I'd focus on that. And I know AWT has a lot of resources to help people study for the technical part of the examination. And then Jay Farmery is the presenter that prepares people to understand regulatory better at the technical training seminars. He does a great job with that. 
Absolutely. And another aspect of the test, which I, I've learned from talking to people, is you know a paper test is going to test you technically. What do you know? No, technically, do you do you know the answer to this question? It's hard to make a test to test the practical side of it all. So if you've always considered yourself more of the the practical, the school of hard knocks kind of person, you know you you need to study the the technical side as well. So so you can choose between answers A, B, C, and D, and know the technical answer because it's it's hard to put a multiple choice test together to test the practical side as well as the technical. That's a great point. And James, I, I have to let you know, you're going to get a phone call. You just use the word test instead of, oh, instead I'm of sorry. examination. Exam. Yes, yes. And apparently there's a drinking game going around whenever I say test instead of examination. Yes. So I don't encourage that at work, by the way. I even made a mental note. Don't say test. <laughs> So you you never stay not busy. That was a double negative. We're not supposed to put those in the test, but I guess in a podcast, <laughs> that's okay. You you are always doing something. I, I can't even begin to to think about all the stuff that you're doing. You actually lobbied for a holiday for us water treatment folk. Yes. We now officially have a holiday. It's called Industrial Water Week. That is amazing. Yes. And it, it, it came about because, you know, we, we had Donut Day that, uh, that, that just came around, I think. We had Groundhog's Day. And I was looking, and, and there's a National Indoor Plant Day. There's Chemistry Week. There's even an Underwear Day. There's all these different holidays. I'm like, well, is there an industrial water holiday? So I was looking, and, and there is an International Water Day, I believe, in March, but that only has a very small component of for industrial water. There's Water Quality Month in August, but that wasn't enough either. So I was like, we need our own holiday. So I, I looked up. I was like, you know, how do you start a holiday? And basically, anybody can start a holiday. All you need is a good idea and, and marketing behind it. So I was like, well, maybe I can do both of those. So we now have um, Industrial Water Week this year. It's October 1st through the 5th. There is a website for it, and that's www.industrialwaterweek.com or also industrialwaterweek.org, whichever you want. And there are social media pages for it, LinkedIn and Facebook and, and Twitter and YouTube. And I'll, I'll probably be adding a, a couple more. And I, I've been making commercials for it and memes for it. And the whole concept of, of the entire thing is that it's not about me. It's, it's about all, all of you guys. No one knows what we do. And you've said this before, Trace, and Jim has said it in the past, and Dick Horrigan, he just said it on, on his. No one knows what we do as a career. You either fall into industrial water treatment or you're born into it. And, and that's it. And so there are efforts out there to, to, to spread the word of what we do. And I thought, why not have a holiday that, that not only celebrates what we do to ourselves, but also as another way of, of getting the word out to what we do. And this, and this holiday isn't much. There are theme days, because I was thinking, would a week be enough, or, or a month, or, or a day? And I didn't think a day was enough, and a month seemed like too much. But I thought a week, a five-day week. And so we have pre-treatment Monday, and and Boiler Tuesday and Cooling Wednesday and Wastewater Thursday and Careers Friday. And so there are themes for, for each day. And it's how do you celebrate? It's entirely up to you. And the website tells you that. It's entirely up to you. you you're out in the field. Take a selfie of what you're doing and post it and tag it with, with hashtag Industrial Water Week. Or put it on the Industrial Water Week social media sites, LinkedIn and Facebook or what have you. Just share what you're doing. And so when you hashtag it with, with hashtag Industrial Water Week, when people search for that hashtag, you know, Google or what have you is going to bring up what everyone else in the, in the world is doing. And because it's just not a holiday in the U.S., it is a worldwide holiday. Anyone can do it. And I figure with, with my 14,000 connections I have on LinkedIn in over 143 countries, maybe I can get the word out to make sure that this truly is a global holiday. And I've been watching the traffic on my website, and there are people from all over the world looking at it. And behind the scenes, I've been, been contacting editors of, of various trade journals and various sundry people. So hopefully by the time October 1st through 5th comes around, we will have enough people behind it that, you know, it'll be kind of fun. And I'm working to add resources on the web page as well. So there are memes and what have you out there for, for you to share as well. So 
that's what it is. So please celebrate. It's all about you. It's not about me. I, my my plans are that hopefully one day my name will even be connected to it anymore because it'll, it'll keep on moving on on its own. Amazing, James. I just think that that's great. And I cannot wait to celebrate October 1st through 5th for Industrial Water Treatment Week. That's amazing. Thank you. By the way, what does one do on Underwear Day? <laughs> you know, I, I was afraid to Google too much about that. You never know what will pop up. <laughs> Fair enough. To shift gears again, we're doing that a lot on this show, but it's okay. There's no rules on the show. You have been instrumental in creating a lot of tools that water treaters could use, and sometimes for free. Sometimes they need a membership to the Association of Water Technologies, but not all the time. And I know myself, it's, it's difficult to go on the AWT website and look for some of these things unless I specifically know what I'm looking for. So I was hoping you could take a moment and maybe let the Scaling Up Nation know what are some of these tools that are available to us? Yeah, absolutely. I was just going over again the, the AWT website, and I've been through it several times. And every time I go through it, I find something new. And there's an amazing amount of information hiding right there. It really is a gold mine. And what's also amazing about it is even if you're not a member of the AWT, there's still a lot there to, to mine from it and give you a taste of maybe how much more is on the other side of that membership wall. So, so maybe you want to join. But the AWT website is awt.org, and I, I'm just amazed at how much is there. You can not only find a supplier or find a water treater if you're, if you're a client or a customer or even looking for a job for find a water treater. There's so much there for education. You can find out information about, about being a member, of course, but education. If you look under education and events, there's even a training schedule. You know, I'm new in the industry one year. What, what should I read? What, what should I research? You know, I'm, I'm going for my, my CWT. What level should, should I be reading now? There's a path there for you, and I find that so, so interesting. There's also a path as well for if you want technical training, not only can you go and attend it live, but there, there's also online training available. And you get a reduced rate on that if you're a member, but still it seems to be very affordable if you're not a member. And even webinars, there's so many webinars. And if you're a member, they're free. If you're not a member, it's a nominal cost, but these webinars are all worth a CEU. And so if you have your CWT and you need to go and recertify, these webinars are a great way of racking up more CEUs for what you need. Because I don't know if you covered this before, Trace, but you know when, when you're earning your CEUs to recertify for your CWT, you don't have to attend a convention. That, that could be something that may be holding you back from getting your, your CWT because you're like, man, I can't go to convention every year. I'll never earn my CEUs. Not necessary. You know, it, it's a great way of getting your, your CEUs, but there's a there's a plethora of other ways of getting your CEUs, and they can be found right here on the website. So make sure you go in and, and look at the, the education and events. Well, James, thanks so much for taking us through that. I know it's very intimidating for somebody to go on the website. If they're looking for something, maybe it's a little bit easier, but if they're just trying to explore, sometimes that's, that is intimidating. That's difficult to do. So you taking us through the entire site, I think it's going to whet everybody's appetite for something that they can go look for. And I tell you, I didn't know some of those things were up there you mentioned. There's a ton. And really, you know, if you have 10 minutes, sit down and start wondering and exploring through it. You'll be amazed at what you find. I was last night and I, I've been through it several times and I keep finding new things every time. And I also want to mention, in addition to the AWT website, if you're looking for other resources as well, I made the industrialwaterscience.com website, and I just made that as, a, as a, another resource for our industry, in particular for young professionals, as a place to go to and see links to other resources we have out there. So if you have time, visit industrialwaterscience.com for even more links to complement what's already here on the AWT website. James, you really are an inspiration on how somebody can raise this industry. It's amazing all the things that you do. And thank you for doing all of that. You're welcome. It's, it's a passion. It's fun. Well, speaking of that, you take one of your other passions, which is voice acting, and you've created a Detective H2O series. We mentioned this briefly on the last time you were on, but I know you've developed it a little bit more. So if you don't mind, tell the Scaling Up Nation a little bit about Detective H2O. Well, 
I started my Detective H. Tool series back in August of 2016, and it's about a character. His name is Herbert Henry Oxidane, P-I-C-W-T. I made him as C-W-T as well. In Herbert Henry Oxidane, his initials are H-H-O or H-2-O, so he's called Detective H-2-O. Some of the characters in there call him Ox as well because his last name is Oxidane, and Oxidane is, is the international term for water, actually. So um, he's Detective H2O, and he goes through and he he solves all these water-related mysteries. And so he solved mysteries on, on dealkalizers. He's to solve them on on a closed loop with, with with increasing iron levels. I call that one the case of high irony. He's done an analysis on a non-chemical device, and that was called the case of uncertainty. He's worked on, on deiterator venting and, and discussed that with boiler operators, and that was the case of de plume, de plume. He's done RO cleaning and, and normalization. He's talked about condensate contamination, solved mysteries on high conductivities in boilers, a microbiologically found RO, and even a misdiagnosed oxidized biocide feed as well. And so, you know, he's done a wide ra range of, of different topics, and he does it in, in a, a detected noir theme. And I, I like to bring different genres into to our world of industrial water treatment, just like you're doing with bringing in different media with the podcast into our world of industrial water treatment. So I've written The Detective H2O, and I listen to other podcasts, and there is a, a Star Trek podcast I listen to as well. It's a fan-based one called Outpost, and they had auditions. And I'm like, well, why couldn't I do a voice on that show? So I auditioned, and I got accepted, and I had just, just a few lines of this alien. His name was Brawl, and if you listen to the episode, you wouldn't even recognize my voice because they totally changed it and altered it. And I sound like this big thug monster on there now. But that was fun. So I was like, you know, why why can't maybe I try the same thing with, with my Detective H2O series? So I did one and I did my first one. And it's the case of the short changing deocalizer. And I had a, a limited range of voice actors. So, you know, I kind of did all the work myself. So we'll see whether or not I've fallen into what's called the uncanny valley on whether or not it sounds like a good show or whether it's just plain creepy and weird. I don't know because I'm the one who recorded it. So you guys, please tell me is if it's worth my time or not. And if I have made the most cringeworthy thing possible, I don't know. But that's where I am. Oh, and in addition to Detective H2O, I do have a Dr. H2O as well. And that's his daughter. And I wrote that one with, with my daughter in mind. Her name is Hilda Helen Oxidane. Her initials also are HHO or, or H2O. But she's a doctor and she takes kind of like a doctor's approach to solving th th things as well. And the only episode I've written so far is, is hard diagnosis about a, a water softener that's going hard prematurely. Perfect. Jace, what episode are we going to be listening to today? This is the case of the short-changing deocalizer. All right. Well, I hope everybody out there enjoys the debut broadcast of the case of the short-changing deocalizer. Welcome to Detective H2O, the case of the short-changing deocalizer. It was a dark and stormy morning as sheets of rain poured between the downtown buildings. Herbert Henry Oxidane, P.I.C.W.T., watched the thick layer of water flow down his office windows. He looked mildly amused when the black mid-20th century phone rang to life on his desk. On the third ring, he answered, Detective H2 here, the best water treater this side of the Ohio, solving water problems drop by drop. What you got? Ox, I need you. This is Louie. Spit it out. My deocalizer's tripping on me. Not doing the job I used to do, see? I track its output daily, but lately it's been making less water each day. Out of the blue. Steam load's the same, but my neutralizing amine usage is up too. Makes no sense to me and the boys. Something's on the take. We need to call you in. When can you and that beat-up fort of yours be here? I knew that dilapidated Dioc would bite the big one soon. My wipers are practically pushing up daisies, but I'll drive between the drops. See at half past the ten. When Detective H2O slid into the back parking lot of Waterville Memorial Hospital, the rain had let up just a bit. He grabbed his mobile water test kit 
sample bottles, and briefcase, and made a run for it. Louis was there to hold the powerhouse door open just in time. Now, tell me the scoop. Your deoxalizers are putting out less water. Yes, Ox. We track the meter readings daily, see? Steam rates are rock solid. Throughput between deoc regenerations are the same, but daily production has taken a nosedive. My boys also noticed that the neutralizing usage is up to keep the pH controlled, see? The phosphate in the boilers has been running a bit lower than the norm, still within range, but on the lower end. Detective H2O knew this boiler room well. Three beautiful water tube boilers formed a semicircle around the room, like three stately dames. Softened deoculized water was the makeup, with a high condensate return rate. The gang of operators were the best in the business. They ran a tight ship with pride. Have you checked the makeup water meter? Yes, it matches the regeneration meters like twins. I know better than to ask if the boiler neutralized condi is within range with you guys. Has the city makeup water quality changed? After Louis shrugged, Detective H2O cracked open his water test kit to find the city water hadn't changed the story, consistent as ever. Any leaking bypass valves around the deoc? No, we check the alkalinity far downstream of any possible bypass, and the alkalinity is legit. Low as ever, even at the end of the service run. Hmm, how about condensate quality? Anything there? Detective H2O asked as he perused the operator logs. As you can see, Ox, just a couple of blips here and there in connectivity and once in hardness, but nothing consistent. What do you think it is, Ox? I have my suspicions, Louis. Grab one of your boys, and let's do a condensate survey. You think there's something in the pipes, Ox? Yes, I think there's something in the pipes. As Louis went to track down his comrade, Detective H2O put together a quick kit. Sample bottles, tongs, connectivity meter, rubber gloves, hardness indicator, and a bucket filled with a little cool water. Ox, this is Tommy. He knows the condensate system like the back of his hands. Tommy only has one hand. He has a good memory. Going from one condensate receiver to another, Detective H2O trailed the two men and collected water samples. He marked and capped them and sat them in the bucket of water to cool. At the last one, he started testing the cooled samples. Connectivity and hardness test all the way around. They hit gold on the second to last sample. Elevated connectivity in the sample turned magenta red when hardness indicator juice was added. Louis, I think we found something. What system send water back to the east wing condensate receiver? Asked Detective H2O. Tommy? Well, let me cogitate. Aside from the air handling units, there's that water heater, replied Tommy. Let's see this water heater. The potable water heater was steam heated using a shell and tube heat exchanger. Tommy cracked open the condensate line just south of the steam trap. Water poured out. They took a sample. Eureka! Elevated conductivity and hardness. You found it, Ox! The water leaking through the seed exchanger elbowed in on what the deoculizer would have normally provided. But how does that explain the increased demand of neutralizing amine? Elementary, my dear Swanson. Remember, the deox cut the alkalinity in the makeup water. No such luxury with this stowaway water leak getting back to the boilers. Bicarbonate alkalinity turns into carbon dioxide in the boilers, lurks out with the steam, turns into carbonic acid in the condensate, and drops the pH. The trade-off is more neutralizing amine to maintain the pH set point. The final piece of the puzzle is the hardness reacting with the phosphate in the boiler, causing the phosphate dip you saw. Simple as one, two, three. You solved another one, Ox. Or should I say Detective H2O? Best water treater this side of the Ohio. It's a wet and dirty job, but some saps gotta do it. In the underbelly and penthouses of the metropolis of Waterville, where the boilers percolate and cooling towers fog, there is one man who works tirelessly to end corrosion, stop scale, fight low-life microbes, and conserve water. That man is Detective H2O, best water treater this side of the Ohio, solving water problems drop by drop. 
Scaling Up Nation, are you like me? Do you wonder when James McDonald sleeps? He does so much for the water treatment community. It is amazing. James, the Scaling Up Nation loves you. The water treatment industry loves you. And thank you so much for all that you do. Now, we spoke a little bit about the Certified Water Technologist designation. And for those of you out there that don't know what that is, the CWT is the highest designation that somebody who practices in the area of water treatment like I do to receive, and that shows everybody you come in contact with that you have the highest designation out there behind you. So I am just ecstatic with how many people this past year have accepted my CWT challenge and you've written in to me to let me know that you are gonna take your examination. Well, folks, I'm gonna recognize those people very shortly, so stay tuned for that. But I wanna give you some news about the CWT examination that is hot off of the press. So the CWT examination is no longer going to be offered in person. Now, what does that mean? So say you came to one of the technical trainings that the AWT Educational Committee puts on well, normally when that's done, we would then offer the examination that Sunday. We're not going to do that anymore. The AWT is not going to do that anymore. And you're probably thinking, oh man, I missed out. But I want to explain this to you because this is actually the best news ever. I've seen the statistics of the test results that come in. And folks, the people that take the test from the testing center do far better than the people that take the test in person at an AWT event. So why not take it from a testing center? Well, think about why that is. Well, you're in a very unfamiliar place. You didn't wake up in your own bed. You've been jammed, packed with all of this information for the past three and a half days, and your mind is just full. It's hard to concentrate. You've got all these things going against you. So my advice, if you've listened to this show before, is to always go to a testing center that is right down the street from your home. You can wake up in your own bed. You can plan around your schedule. And my advice is after you go to a technical training, schedule the examination. Actually, my advice would be to schedule it before you go to technical training because then you're going to study even harder and pay attention even better. And then when you come back, you can review your notes and go and take that examination from a testing center. And as the results prove, you're going to do better there than if you did it on a paper exam. I can't say that you personally are going to do that, but that is the statistics that I have read. So why not take advantage of that? I think the number one benefit for taking the test on the computerized format is you can mark your answers. Just think, you can't figure out the answer for number 10, so you move on to number 11, but it's a Scantron, and number 11's answer is now in number 10 slot, and you get to the end of the examination and realize you're one short. Folks, that is a bad day, and friend of show, Angela Pike, has confirmed that that has happened before. Well, it can't happen now. Because you take the test at the testing center, you can mark your answer, and then it will actually remind you to come back to everything that you marked. Really cool stuff. So just keep that in mind. It shouldn't affect anybody that's taking the examination, only to give you some better results. Now, as I mentioned, we had several people that wrote into me and signed up for the CWT challenge, and I am so pleased to say that we have 16 CWTs that we did not have last year, and I am so proud of those people. And folks, I'm going to tell you who they are because I'm so proud of them. So we have Brian Burgess, Gary Ho, Jim Davis, Jeffrey Chan, Kevin Haskins, Kyle Rossi, Connor Parrish, William Pagano, Matt Brooks, John Weddle, Pat Pat, I'm going to mess up your name. I know you. I know you. I know Pat, but uh, your last name, I, I just cannot pronounce, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. So forgive me. Everybody congratulate Pat. He did a great job. Roger Anderson, 
Kevin, Thurston, Jeff Burton, and Travis Long. Folks, those are 16 individuals that have answered the challenge and they are now making the industry better. They have decided that this isn't a job anymore. This is their career. And everywhere they go, that CWT designation is going to follow them. And everybody they come in contact with is going to know that they take water treatment seriously. You guys are awesome. Now, there are several people out there that still have taken the CWT challenge but have not taken their CWT. That's okay. I'm just recognizing the people that have gone through with it. Now, if you have not started studying for that yet, I've got some resources for you listed on my show notes page. And of course, if you haven't gotten my five tips to taking the CWT examination, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT and you can get that and I promise that will help you out. Now, next week, I've got something really cool in store for the Scaling Up Nation. As you know, James McDonald has created an international holiday for us. It is called Industrial Water Week. Folks, we are going to have an episode each and every day next week. That means you're going to hear Scaling Up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That's how we're going to celebrate Industrial Water Week. And we're even going to go a step further. The fine folks of the Scaling Up Nation have called in to me, recorded their voices, and they are going to be my guests on Scaling Up. They're asking questions, and we're going to answer them each and every day on Scaling Up. I'm so excited about this. Folks, it's going to be awesome. So join me next week for Industrial Water Week, and I can't wait to see you next time on Scaling Up. Scaling Up.